right, and we are recording. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Let me see if I can remember totally how to do this because I know that I need to um, have it be the presentation mode so you guys aren't seeing all of the, <laughs> the notes and not so fun stuff. Um, let me see here. Maybe I can do that after the fact. Okay. Um, you'd think that I would be used to this by now because I've been doing it for school all the time, but still not so much. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Can everybody see the intro slide? Good. Okay. Um, so my name is Kyla, and um, I know we were just chatting a little bit, um, but I am from Michigan, and um, I'm actually currently a um, grad student with um, the, Inter the Institute for Humane Education. Um, they've partnered with Antioch University, um, and it is a program focused on humane education. And so I actually had um, the opportunity to take a class called Race, Intersectionality, and Veganism, um, and ended up developing a presentation for that course and have kind of developed it out a little bit since then um, and really felt like it was something that um, I could share with a broader audience. And so um, I actually have some fun notes here. If you haven't noticed yet, I speak very quickly. Um, and so in order to try to slow myself down, make sure that I'm, I'm pacing myself okay, um, I am going to be referencing my notes just a little bit to kind of keep me from just driving you all crazy with the <laughs> talking too quickly. So um, let's see. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was going to, I have some pointers to go over. So I will get those when we get to the expectation slides. But um, so as I'm sure you are aware, you guys are here. So obviously, you know, um, we're going to be talking about racism in the animal liberation movement um, and how we as white activists, um, I will make a note that this um, presentation was initially designed with the target audience of white vegan activists in mind. Um, we must work to ensure that this movement as a whole is inclusive um, and that it is adhering to its own consistent anti-oppression values. Um, as we know, animal liberation movement, the vegan movement is one that is fighting very deeply embedded systems of oppression. Um, so it's critical that we not only recognize um, the intersections of oppression, but also the intersection of the systems that actually cause these oppressions. Um, it's only then that we are going to be able to achieve any semblance of true liberation. Allowing racism to persist um, and engaging in actions that reinforce racist systems serves only to harm not only fellow humans, but also the movement as a whole and ultimately the non-humans that we profess to fight on behalf of. So like I said, I initially developed this presentation back in April um, with a target audience of, of fellow white vegan activists in mind because I recognize that ultimately the onus is on us um, to address, address racism. Um, and no matter how you self-identify though, I really hope that you are going to find this presentation informative and helpful. Much of the information um, that is in the presentation that I'm going to be sharing are, is based on theories from black uh, decolonial vegans um, who have really started doing this work in depth. Um, but this presentation is far from exhaustive. Um, it is definitely a very cursory um, introduction to the topic, but I felt that it was important to start that so we can begin having the conversations um, that have previously just been really difficult to have um, so that we can move forward to collectively address you the issue of um, racism within the movement. So that's probably the screen that should have been up while I was talking at you. So here are the expectations that I had kind of set forth. And I know there are only a few of us, so I don't think it'll be, um, you know, as big of a thing. But since we're going to be talking about um, a topic that is just in many ways socially taboo, but is definitely something that is uncomfortable, um, and we're going to be confronting a lot of things that are, are probably pretty uncomfortable for many of us, um, I just want to remind everybody that we're here to learn and None of us is gonna get it right all the time. Um, we really just are here to try to be better advocates, allies, um, and activists, not only for each other, but also for non-human animals. Um, so I'm really just hoping that you guys are able to keep an open mind um, and be open to the information that we're going to be talking about. Um, this also requires that we are willing to be honest with ourselves 
um, and acknowledge that it's very likely that our own past behaviors um, have reinforced systems or even been racist in nature um, in the past, regardless of what our intentions might have been. Um, and it's important to remember that in order to create a movement that is inclusive, we really need to be able to face our own discomfort um, and be willing to recognize how we have been complicit um, previously, how we might still end up being complicit and be willing to kind of move through that and learn how to do better going forward. Um, we've all come here to better understand how oppressive systems and frameworks are reinforced through our actions, our inactions. Um, and, and to do that, we can begin addressing these issues in a way that will allow us to learn and to move forward. Um, we really need to focus on creating change that is effective. Um, and in doing that, we need to create inclusive anti-oppression movements. So there are probably going to be a number of questions um, that come up for you during the presentation. I welcome that. Um, I did. Um, when I was talking with Suzanne, we kind of built some time in at the end to have a discussion afterwards. I know that usually um, when you guys meet that you kind of operate off of a, a conversation basis. So I really appreciate you being willing to work with this format um, and, and listen to me speak to you today. Um, but like I said, I would really love to be able to have a discussion with you afterwards. Um, and any conversation or excuse me, any questions that you have um, can be a part of that conversation. I really do welcome that. Um, that's how we learn is, is in, in conversation with one another. Um, and so while this presentation, like I said, was developed for white activists, um, as we're the group really responsible for addressing these issues. Um, I recognize that not all attendees might identify as white. Um, and so when we do get to that discussion portion, I just ask that you um, really honor the voices that are very often silenced or ignored um, and be cognizant of the fact that we are really in a position where we need to start elevating um, voices of color and voices from the global majority and people who have otherwise largely been marginalized. Um, it's really important that we commit to actively listening to one another and doing so objectively, um, responding once we've really only truly heard and considered each other's comments. And I know within this group that that's something you guys always do. Um, I just like to always make a note of it because I think especially with such um, sensitive topics that it's really important. Um, I'm really hoping that we can kind of start fostering a community that, that can um, work together and, and commit to addressing these issues um, collectively. And before we move on, on, on that note, I do want to address my own whiteness um, and, and how I am centering my own voice um, in a discussion on racism and kind of how that can seem a little bit backwards. Um, and of course, I encourage the centering of non-white voices just in general, but I also recognize that I hold privilege and that I'm in a position to um, begin having these conversations with other white people in a way that might be a little bit less um, uncomfortable so that we feel like we can start having these important dialogues. Um, and so, like I said, the onus is on us. It is not on our fellow activists of color. And so that is why I have, um, you know, felt like I really needed to start having these conversations with the people I care about and the people in the community around me. So um, I'm going to share a series of questions with you. I don't want you guys to answer out loud, um, but I really want you to just kind of think about them to yourself and, and to get you start thinking about what we're going to be talking about. If you have paper and pen and you want to jot down your answers or anything that might come to mind um, and revisit that later, of course, I encourage you to do that. Um, but like I said, no one's going to hear your responses unless you, incur, you know, want to share. Um, so I just really urge you to consider each of the questions critically. Um, if you notice that you're feeling a little bit defensive um, or, you know, kind of feel immediately a need to justify some kind of response or action, think about why that is um, and maybe jot those feelings down as well. Um, the questions are not meant to imply judgment. They're intended to allow you to start examining the issue um, of racism in the animal liberation movement more critically. So there are no right or wrong answers. Again, they're just questions to um, answer silently to yourself or to jot down um, to get you guys to start thinking. So I'm gonna take a few moments to be quiet and let you read through those and start thinking about them. I will meet myself as well.
And if you guys just want to give me a quick thumbs up when you're ready, I don't want to sit here and stare at you if you're all set. All right, is everybody okay if I move away from the screen? You can keep writing, I just, if anyone still needs it, show me a little sign. Okay, all right, I am going to go ahead and move on to the next. Like I said, if you guys are still jotting notes, totally okay. Um, okay, uh, so, I really want to make sure that there are some working definitions and there are some words that maybe we are not quite accustomed to hearing or um, words that I think need to just kind of be explained in a specific context. Um, so obviously some of these things are going to be words that we're familiar with and others not so much. So I just wanted to go over um, specifically what I mean. And it's not on the list, but, uh, and I know this might not necessarily be um, something I have to specify with you guys, but just to be to be safe, when I'm speaking about veganism, um, in this context, I'm referring specifically to ethical veganism. Um, so adopting a plant based diet and the accompanying vegan lifestyle. Um, and when we define racism, um, or systemic racism, I want to think about racism in a way that looks at it structurally, um, as this sort of interconnected system. Um, that's just really built into the very foundations of our society. So while individuals, of course, may act in explicitly racist ways, um, when we define racism, it's really important that we look at it as the complex interconnected system um, that it is, because this is really how we are able to acknowledge just how far reaching its impacts really are, um, but also the ways in which people who identify themselves as being against racism can still manage to be complicit um, in reinforcing racism and racial inequity. Um, so while there are, of course, you know, myriad examples um, of intentional and explicit racism uh, within the animal liberation movement, I really want to focus more on the sort of unintentional um, or systemic racism, which is quite often a lot harder to recognize, um, and because of that, a little bit more difficult to address. Um, and similarly, when we're talking about white supremacy, I'm not talking just about the individual actions um, or intentions of, you know, individual white supremacists, but rather the systemic nature um, of white supremacist power structures um, and the way that they shape our society, the way that they shape our social practices, um, and the way that they have really kind of built these racial hierarchies in our society. Now, colonialism is something that occurs when a group of people um, is dominated and subjugated by another group. Um, colonization allows for um, those in power, so the colonizing powers, to determine what the accepted narratives are um, and the epistemologies that they are able to then impose on the groups that they have colonized. Um, I wanted to make a note, too, about intersectionality. So um, intersectionality is actually a Black feminist legal theory. Um, it's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw um, back in the 80s, actually. We've seen sort of this resurgence of the term, definitely, though. Um, but it was um, developed to acknowledge the way that many of us have um, multiple aspects of our identity that define who we are and dictate our life experiences. 
Uh, and very often this results in sort of this overlapping multi-layered form of injustice. And within the animal liberation movement, um, recognizing intersectionality means that we are able to acknowledge systems of oppression um, and the way that they're interwoven and connected. Um, and that dismantling one means that we need to start at the root of all of them. So in other words, our activism, our advocacy cannot and should not be singularly focused. Um, I do wanna take a moment to point out though that the way we often see intersectionality being used within the context of the movement um, is erroneous, it's misapplied, um, but it's also actively sort of co-opting this concept um, as a way to sort of performatively, performatively advance our own social justice movement. Um, the theoretical framework that intersectionality provides us um, really helps us to understand how oppression intersects, how oppression overlaps, but we really need to be cognizant of how we are applying the term um, when it comes to talking about our own activism. Um, if any of you are familiar with AFCO, um, she's one of the decolonial black theorists that I mentioned, um, and she has talked a lot about the idea of multidimensionality and the way that it isn't so much a matter of intersecting, um, but sort of that there are all these different layers and levels and, and dimensions um, involved in oppression and involved in white supremacy. Um, so if you're not familiar with her, I will pop some, um, there are some links at the end, but I will um, pop her name in the chat when we're done too. Um, and it's really difficult because we have these sort of Eurocentric colonial frameworks that, that have truly dictated the way that we see the world around us, the way that we perceive things. Um, and it's this Eurocentric construct of animality that uses this sort of human animal hierarchy um, to place people who are white, cis hetero, able bodied, typically male, um, at sort of the top. And anybody who really doesn't identify as either of those, or any of those rather, um, as less than or, or beneath that. Um, and we see anybody um, you know, outside of this realm of whiteness as, as closer to animal within this hierarchy. Um, the hierarchy sees absolutely no value in non-human life. And so when we animalize humans, um, we create conditions in which the oppression of people who we categorize as, as you know, animal um, is able to be justified. So when we move away from that hierarchy, um, you know, it requires that we are recognizing the animal in all of us. Um, and we really need to just kind of decolonize the way that we see the world, our current frameworks, our current frameworks of understanding how we interact with the world around us. And one way that um, Black vegans and Black vegan activists are doing this is through the practice of Black veganism. Um, this isn't just about being Black and being vegan. Um, it's really calling into question those very frameworks that um, have really formed our, our way of understanding the world and our way of interacting um, with one another as humans and with non-human animals. Um, in order to sort of bring this kind of new understanding and new way to look at the way that these movements that want to achieve liberation are, are structured. Um, so it really looks at the, the politics and the structure of the black liberation movement um, and tries to come at them through a new lens that sort of blends these two um, you know, ideas together. So racial liberation as well as animal liberation. Um, and so this is some of the work that AFCO, um, who I mentioned and her sister Silco have really um, been trying to do and they say that, um, this, I think this little quote is in there from them, um, but they say that uh, when we see black veganism that their goal really is to um, encourage activists to think about and articulate the animal situation um, as they see fit through their lived experiences as people of color, as black people, um, which really is kind of that first step in allowing us to start decolonizing those um, frameworks that we've been sort of operating under. So these are just some of the concepts, um, definitions that I want you guys to keep in mind um, and, and things that will kind of help as we move forward with understanding some of the things we're gonna be talking about. Um, one of the most basic and yet fundamental ways that we can um, you know, create a movement that is welcoming, that is inclusive um, and ensure that our movement represents and honor a variety of voices is, is to just represent those people and, and provide um, an opportunity where all voices are heard and all voices are represented. So right now, when many of us um, 
see vegan, see the vegan animal rights movement, we see them as primarily white movements. Even if they're not, that is really how they're perceived, um, largely by people within the movement, but also by people outside of it. Um, it's an erroneous assumption, and it ignores and erases the contributions of vegans and activists of color, but it also creates a movement that best case is actively exclusive, um, but worst case really just makes activist spaces feel hostile um, or unsafe for activists who are not white identifying. Um, it completely ignores the fact that black Americans constitute the fastest growing population um, of vegans within the US. And globally, plant-based living has predominantly been found in non-white culture um, and in communities for centuries. So when we have these white dominated spaces, it's really most often that we see the voices of white vegans and white activists given platform and made visible. I understand that that also refers to me. <laughs> um, and this lack of visible representation of voices of color um, as members of these movements really sort of fosters this feeling of unwelcome and exclusivity. And so as humans, when we don't feel seen and we don't feel heard, we're far less likely to engage or participate um, in the groups or in the activities that we feel excluded from. So it's really no wonder that when communities are systematically, systematically silenced um, or excluded, that they're not going to want to align themselves with a movement that is really responsible for continuing that, that exclusion. <clears throat> so all social movements, of course, benefit from a variety of perspectives, um, contributions from people who have diverse backgrounds and diverse personal experiences. And within the animal rights and animal liberation movement, it is the movement's failure to create a welcome and inclusive space um, for vegans and activists of color that through visible representation um, and through honoring their perspectives um, and contributions that ultimately ends up damaging the potential success of the movement um, and the vitality of the movement. And of course, you know, blatant racism obviously fosters environments of hostility. There's no question there. Um, but just as frequently, well-meaning organizations, well-meaning spaces, um, and well-meaning communities within the movement can foster these same feelings. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that going forward. First, it's important to acknowledge, though, that like I said, all representation matters. Um, all perspectives are valuable. And when we frame the fight against non-human oppression and exploitation, having that variety of perspectives is really important. Um, by lifting up and giving platform to vegans and activists of color, we can really start honoring those perspectives, um, but also start building a more effective and inclusive movement. We cannot, though, expect um, vegans of color to just simply want to be a part of the animal rights movement just because we've committed to being anti-racist um, or, or to stop perpetuating these harmful systems. This movement really replicates um, white supremacist structures in a lot of ways. And so being inclusive in this context really requires learning from and incorporating work um, specifically by people of color. Um, in addition to uplifting the work that many of them are already doing um, within their own communities. Um, and and um, honestly, some of them separate from the mainstream animal rights movement, okay? It's not always, you know, vegans um, who are doing some of the really important work that, that can help us accomplish um, our end goal of animal liberation and vegan world 2026, so. Um, in addition to this lack of representation um, within the movement, we also see people of color being actively excluded when we're making assumptions um, about other people's lived experiences. Um, as white people, we view the world through very different racial lenses um, than our fellow activists, vegans, and community members of color. Um, obviously, this isn't anything intentional on our part. It was just it's how, how things have been. It is not how things have to be, though. Um, this white supremacist racial lens is something that is subconscious. You know, we, we very rarely have to think about the fact that we're white. Um, more so now, you know, we are starting to, to become a little bit more aware, but we really haven't ever been forced to, to consider our race um, more often than not. And our society really operates from a foundation of systems that normalize our white experience. Um, to the extent that we as white people kind of make the assumption that our worldview and our way of experiencing the world around us is the only one or, or that it might just be the only right one. Um, and this can often manifest itself in our outreach 
um, and in the way that we interact with um, vegans and activists of color. So when we fail to acknowledge that other people's lived experiences um, through their own racial lenses are, are different than ours, um, we fail to kind of give consideration to the impact that systemic racial violence and these sort of constant stresses um, related to simply existing in a world that's so bound by this white supremacist hierarchy, um, we, we fail to, we fall prey rather, excuse me, to, to making assumptions about other people's motivations, um, about their means, about their experiences, and about their just general being. And in outreach, these sort of Eurocentric driven assumptions can appear in the form of maybe making assumptions that a vegan or plant-based diet might be easy for everyone, um, or that access to vegan foods or resources is the same for everyone. And in the realm of um, activist communities, we really see these assumptions breed misunderstanding um, about the need for survival, just taking precedence over engaging in any other type of anti-oppression movement or actions. Um, and these are just a couple examples of the ways in which assumptions made through our own white centric lenses can be damaging um, to other people, whether they be vegan activists, um, fellow vegans of color, or people that we might be speaking to in sort of an outreach capacity. Um, when we look at social justice movements as a whole, and you know, I don't want to just pick on the animal rights movement. I'm only talking about it because it's a, <laughs> it's a movement that I'm a part of. Um, but social justice movements as a whole really kind of focus their, their efforts and attention primarily on a single issue. And that's, of course, to be expected. But when they fail to address related issues and related oppressions, um, when sort of building the frameworks that the movements operate on, it really increases the potential for failure um, in achieving the overarching goals of the movement. So specifically in the case of the animal liberation movement, this can take the form of sort of writing off the intersection of other oppressions, um, which results in our inability to dismantle the systems at the root of those oppressions. I'm sure we've all heard the argument um, that the animal rights, animal liberation movement should only be about the animals. And on the surface, it's a logical argument to make, it really is. Um, I mean, after all, shouldn't a movement that, you know, arose from this desire to see the liberation of non-human animals from systems of repression really only concern itself with that specific goal. You know, I and I'm sure many others would agree that that's not the case. Um, while the fight for non-human animal liberation should certainly be at the forefront um, of this movement, this movement is called the Animal Liberation Movement, it's really imperative that activists recognize the relationship um, between all oppressions because failing to recognize that relationship it is ultimately going to lead to failure when it comes to dismantling the systems that actively perpetuate these oppressions. All systems of oppression share a root cause. Um, so recognizing and addressing that root cause is necessary in order to create a movement framework that's going to allow for working collectively to dismantle these systems in order to achieve true liberation, non-human animals, and humans. Um, because human supremacy very obviously has its roots in white supremacy, it becomes critical that we as animal rights activists um, take race and systemic racism well into consideration um, when we work to understand and dismantle the systems that oppress non-human animals. Um, here I go with F and Silco again, but honestly, if you guys aren't familiar with them, their work is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I have learned a great deal from reading their texts. Um, like I said, I'll share some links at the end as well. They have a collection of essays, actually. Um, this book called Afroism, if you are familiar with it. Um, so it's a collection of essays that they have written together and individually. Um, and within that, they address the concept of animality um, and its relationship to the creation and the way that we conceptualize race. Um, they posit that these sort of white supremacist frameworks that the white man kind of created this racial and species hierarchy, um, it places any humans who don't identify as white, cis hetero, able-bodied males, closer to non-human animals um, than they do to humans. So it sort of um, otherizes people um, in a way that um, is clearly connected to animalizing of other people. So the way that this um, this conceptualization of race um, and animality frames the systems of oppression um, 
is is sort of what dictates the way that that we understand how oppression functions in society. Um, and when we are unable to to recognize that relationship and that constructed relationship between race and animality, um, that prevents us from really understanding the true interconnected nature of the systems of oppression that enact that oppression on both of those groups. Um, so it's really critical that, that race um, and other oppressions um, you know, receive space and attention in this fight for um, animal liberation. Um, and it's important then too that we are creating a movement that provides specific spaces um, for inclusion and respect um, and, and that we're really honoring diverse perspectives and diverse experiences. When we understand that all oppressions share a root cause, we can also recognize that when we draw comparisons between these oppressions, it's not only fallacious, but it is harmful and it can be ineffective. Um, so what I mean to say is that when we compare non-human animal um, exploitation and human exploitation, we're missing the point. Um, dangerously, honestly, because when we do that, we really fail to understand that the connection between these oppressions isn't in the oppressions themselves, it's in the causes of those oppressions. Um, we really need to focus on recognizing the humanity um, in each of the, these oppressed groups, non-human animals and humans alike, um, because that's where the connection lies. And when we leave race out of the equation, we really leave out a key piece of helping us understand the systems that, that drive the oppressions that impact both non-human and human animals. Back to black veganism, black to the co-sisters. Uh, <laughs> um, so as I talked a little bit about at the beginning, um, Af and Silco identify black veganism as encouraging activists to sort of think about and articulate the, the animal experience um, as they see fit through their own lived situation. So black veganism really brings new ways of being vegan to the table um, by recognizing the way that um, our lived experiences influence how we understand and frame the world around us. Um, black veganism also provides activists with sort of this new approach, um, a new way to understand the systems that surround non-human animal exploitation um, through this lens that, that gives us the opportunity to recognize the interconnections of oppression um, and bring together this fight for black liberation, um, liberation for other people of color and animal liberation. So again, when we see that relationship and we're able to identify the root cause of oppression collectively, um, we're much better equipped to start dismantling those systems. Um, so black veganism, like I said, is not about just being black and vegan. Um, it's really about giving animal rights activists um, the tools to, to start rebuilding these frameworks. Um, one of the benefits of recognizing and honoring the perspectives of black veganism is our ability then to examine these systems of oppression through a non-Eurocentric, non-white racial um, or colonial lens. Any anti-oppression movement um, that breeds exclusivity is really aligning itself with the very systems that it's seeking to dismantle. So being able to step outside of white supremacist colonial frameworks um, of understanding oppression can then allow us to avoid this trap of maybe replicating um, those same oppressions in new ways. Any, oh, excuse me, I'm not even in the right spot on my notes. <laughs> when our only understanding of systems of oppression is guided by the frameworks that are responsible for creating those systems of oppression, of course, it's going to be inevitable then that we're going to sort of misstep um, in our fight to eradicate those oppressions. And one way that this manifests itself currently is through campaigns that target indigenous traditions and way of life. Um, these campaigns lack awareness and understanding of indigenous relationships with the natural world. They also ignore the complicity of white supremacist capitalist society and these industrialized systems that we um, really function through um, in causing significantly more harm to both non-human animals and the environment, as well as many fellow humans. And without this ability to examine systems of oppression from a non-colonial, non-Eurocentric framework, we really run the risk of, of failing to truly liberate ourselves um, or others from those systems. Our activism also runs the risk of becoming misguided and misdirected. 
Thus, when we create a movement that doesn't welcome or honor or make space for everyone, namely vegans, activists, and other people of color, both human and non-human animal comrades will continue to suffer. We create effective and well-rounded change movements when we ensure that all voices and all perspectives fighting oppression are welcomed, respected, and given a platform. As animal rights and liberation activists, we really need to make it a point to bring diversified perspectives to the table in ways that are not tokenizing. Um, creating spaces of true inclusion and welcoming requires us to confront our own privilege um, as well as our own complicity in white supremacist systems. And it necessitates that we be willing to open ourselves up to different viewpoints, different frameworks of understanding, um, things that we may not necessarily personally align with or fully understand. Um, and that's critical for building a well-rounded, effective, and solutionary change movement. We absolutely must, must, must be consistent in our message of anti-oppression. Um, it is really hypocritical to rally against one form of oppression while denying or attempting to delegitimize any others. Um, because as we've said, as I've said a bunch of times, all oppression shares a root cause. So when we work together to sort of create this, um, these community driven spaces um, that really reflect a message of consistent anti-oppression, we're then able to start fostering solidarity amongst people from all communities and we will then be able to build movements that are unstoppable. Um, it's only through working together though that any of this is going to be successful. It's important to recognize the validity of the feelings of activists and other movements who might not seek out cross-movement cooperation. Um, and because a lot of this is the result of sort of this regularity with which um, the animal rights and vegan movement um, has really kind of created the not very welcoming spaces <laughs> that it has, um, um, but also other non-race-based social justice movements um, and the way that they also may reinforce these, these white supremacist systems. Um, so it's up to us as white allies to really start fixing these issues so that um, we can start foster situations in which that cross, you know, cross movement community can start being built. And as I've said before, the onus of creating a diverse, inclusive and respectful movement is on white activists. And it's this overarching white supremacist framework that our society operates under that's really responsible for fostering exclusivity, hostility um, and violence um, when we replicate these, these oppressive systems. And there are myriad ways of overcoming these issues, of course, um, but they require work and they require sincere dedication on the part of all activists within the movement. The simplest thing that we can do um, to begin addressing these issues is to just start having conversations. Um, just, just talk to friends, talk to family, talk to fellow activists, um, the community at large about you know, how we can start recognizing this behavior, um, how we can start recognizing and understanding the way that it's problematic when it comes to um, talking about success of our movements. Being able to recognize and to name this behavior, um, especially within the context of the movement, is how we're gonna start being able to eradicate it. We must also, though, be willing to acknowledge, um, acknowledge these behaviors in our own actions or even our own inactions. Um, and in order to become better equipped at identifying this behavior in others, we really need to start looking at ourselves and turn the spotlight inward first um, and, and really acknowledge things that might not be that fun um, <laughs> to acknowledge about things that we have done um, or might still be doing. It's gonna be uncomfortable, it's gonna be hard, um, but it's necessary, especially if we want to align our morals with, with our actions and really work at building these successful um, and inclusive movements. And so through conversations, we can also help others start to, to recognize the relationships between systems of oppression um, and how critical it is that we start dismantling these systems collectively if we really want to achieve um, true liberation. So as white activists, um, we hold privilege within activist spaces as we do elsewhere in the world and, and we need to harness that for good to the best of our ability. Um, so in part, this will involve, <clears throat> excuse me, lifting up, giving platform to the voices of vegans and activists of color. Um, and it also means making sure that all people are, are 
well aware um, of the myriad contributions of folks of color to the movement um, and also to sort of just increasing this awareness of a lot of the critical efforts going on um, that are being spearheaded by activists of color within their own communities, not just across the country, but across the globe. Within our own activism, personally, we really need to focus on refraining from um, drawing these sort of fallacious and harmful comparisons between oppressions and recognize instead that um, there is humanity in all of those who are oppressed. And we really need to commit to dismantling the systems that exist at the root of those oppressions. Um, we want to be careful to avoid making assumptions or generalizations um, about the lived experiences of others through our own Eurocentric sort of white lens um, that we're viewing the world through. And while our efforts, you know, right now might be concentrated within the animal rights movement, we can definitely also uh, demonstrate solidarity with other anti-oppression and social justice movements through direct involvement or other means of support. And finally, we really must be willing to learn and we should understand that we are gonna screw up. We're gonna mess up like repeatedly. It's just, it's, it's a fact of life um, and that's okay. And by making the commitment to just do the best with what we have, where we're at at the time, we can honor the journey of continuous learning um, and, and honor this growth that is necessary um, to bring about real change. It's okay if we change our minds, it's okay if we change our actions in light of new information. Um, and, and in doing so, we can really help to sort of create these spaces where other people feel comfortable doing the same thing. And, oh, sorry not to the sources yet. If we want a movement that's going to work for everybody, it needs to be a movement that um, respects everyone and that honors everyone um, and is aware of the lived experiences of other people and working with those people to actively dismantle the systems of oppression that exist at the root of all injustice. Um, this work is individual, but it's also collective and it starts with us, but it requires that we all work together. Um, so, if anybody is interested, I'm happy to share out this list of resources, but also the presentation as well, um, because I know it was a lot to read and listen to at the same time. Um, so just if you would like any of the um, content or any of the information, please just let me know. Um, there's a slide here and a slide here, and I know it's just a lot to write down. So I am more than happy to, um, to share that out. Uh, if anybody needs to take off, um, I completely understand, but like I said, I would really like for us to um, have a discussion. Um, I would really love to hear your reactions, your responses, um, anything that came to mind, anything that, that stood out for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and exit the um, screen share so that we can all see each other. And I really wanna thank you guys um, for taking the time to, to hear me out. Like I said, I know you're usually conversation based. So to, to listen to somebody just talk at you for 45 minutes is a bit. So I appreciate the, um, the time and attention and um, I wanna hear from you guys. Thank you so much, Kyla. I really um, appreciate all of the work you put into that and um, Yeah, then just getting getting the conversation started. This is great. Yeah, I, I think that this information is really good and it's not only um, applicable to animal rights. I think it's applicable to some other situations as well. So for some conversations that my husband and I are currently having with some people about another topic, this will be helpful. So <laughs> um, I appreciate that from a, from a slightly different um, different ones. And I would love to have a copy of the presentation. I've been taking pictures of your slide. So if you're willing to share, that would be um, even better than having to try and, and put that together. And I just, Afroism is one of my absolute favorite books. It was one of those, uh, oh my God. Yeah. The, the, the way that they write, um, the, the insights that they have is just phenomenal information. Yes. So where I, I'm I'm curious about where you are sharing this presentation, like who, who you, besides us, who you're doing this with. I mean, you said you did it for a project at school, um, and so I'm just I'm just wondering how else you're using it right now, and and what the response has been. 
Yeah. So I, um, obviously I initially developed it for class. I gave it, I presented it, you know, as our, um, end of term project, but, uh, when we developed the our, our end of term projects, it was sort of with this goal of like, how would we take that out into the community? But then everything shut down. <laughs> and so, okay. uh, <laughs> my goal had been, you know, and when when I put it together, I was really thinking about my local activist community. Um, even being so close to Detroit, pretty much everybody who's you know active in in this sort of scene in um, in the area is white. And, um, and so I really felt like it was something, and especially seeing outreach um, by fellow white activists in predominantly um, black areas, um, really kind of drove home the importance for me of um, talking to my local activist group. Um, so that had been my intention. <laughs> um, and so I have been able to, to give the presentation one other time, um, actually hosted by um, Veg Life Des Moines. And I had reached out to them because they were really the first um, vegan organization that I saw come out with um, a statement of solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And so what they had to say in that statement really um, resonated with me as far as kind of how I was feeling about um, sharing the presentation. So I just on a whim said, hey, <laughs> do you want to host this? And um, it was a it was a really great turnout and we had a really great conversation afterwards. And um, I think it's it's just a lot of new information and new concepts and it can be kind of overwhelming. So I think a lot of people were really just um, sort of absorbing and then sitting with the information, but uh, a lot of people were, you know, asking really great questions and um, I think it really got people um, talking in a new way, which was cool. So, but that's the only other time that I have um, had the chance to, to present so far, so. So are, are you willing to do Hi. more of these? Oh, I'm sorry, PJ. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to talk about some of the content, but go ahead. Well, I, I was just curious if you're willing to do more of these presentations with local groups. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I kind of looked at, you know, potential changes that I could make too, or, or even how it might be, um, you know, altered to, like you said, apply to other, um, other movements or other contexts, because I think that like I said, while I am sort of going at it from this lens of, of you know, the vegan movement, um, just because it's a movement that I'm a part of, I really think that you're right, it's, it's applicable, you know, sort of across the board when we look at these movement frameworks. So definitely would be willing to do that, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Kyla. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about it. it, it I, I think, um, But in terms of you know bullet items, where to start? We could start with um, anti-impression values, and that's something that one could talk about with people in different groups. What what is the basic of you're know, not harming animals, and why are you so intent to not harm animals? Because we don't believe in oppression. Is it just oppression of animals? So I think we could go into some more talk there, and the, and that's just one thing because. Uh, I'm involved with other groups and recently there's been conversations about no we're not going to have any of this talk about intersectionality we're here for the animals that's it don't talk about it and um, so it's very relevant and I think um, and I think that's one key thing that you said that that uh, that might be helpful to somebody who does just want to work on the animals. I'm looking for those those things. And I also want to uh, to stand up for their what they're thinking. If they're thinking, look, you know, it's right now we have to focus right now. There's so many millions of animals. Let me focus on that. I don't want to think about you're being sensitive. I don't want to think about you're, you know, you're old and you can't walk in the front of the march. Okay, don't just let us do our thing and fit in where you can. So that's one of the things that I'm, I may be hearing. And so we could talk about that point and then, but then there's others. So I wanna let other people share too. Does anybody have anything to say about that point? I think that you raised a good point, BJ. I see that, um, uh, I've witnessed that before within within different movements of 
um, not recognizing that these are systemic problems or or if um, or if they are they're choosing to really focus on one one area and ignore the the interrelationship and intersectionality between this movement and say the movement right next door um, and I think well First of all, thank you, Kyla. This, the presentation was amazing. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to make the presentation and and, and bring it to us here at Vegan World 2026. Um, I'm looking forward to going back through it. I definitely want a copy of the slides. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and something that stood out for me, um, as well as what BJ brought up, was is trying to hold hold that the the intersectionality with the um, trying not to compare oppression at, at the same time and being able to discuss those things in a way that um, recognizes the importance of of each um, of each group that's being oppressed um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know how to do that and I am very interested in learning more about that because uh, that's something that I know I've run into myself um, in terms of talking about this especially with friends and family um, and and especially in first becoming vegan and, and not really knowing how to talk about it. Um, and that kind of brings me to this underlying theme I've, I've I noticed in your presentation as well as um, some of Dr. Rao's presentations and, and others I've seen recently that one of the most uh, impactful ways of bringing this subject up is to make it about yourself. Always bring your story in first um, and try to not, um, try to not um, imagine what someone else's lived experience is and explain uh, or, or come to any conclusion about it with, with that as your context rather than something from yourself. So I think um, it's really interesting to hear you say that. Um, it seems like that is one of those underlying uh, important tools to use. Um, my husband was also here, although not on camera, and he has a question. Yeah. Um... I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, I was running across a website called Showing Up for Racial Justice, and I was wondering if you'd heard of it. Yeah, they actually have, uh, I was just telling um, Ben and Suzanne, they actually have a um, local chapter here in Michigan too, where they've been uh -huh. doing kind of virtual meetings and um, kind of getting together for different issues that have, things that mostly have been happening right around here. But um, yeah, I think that they're really great um, and, did you, and did you see their their uh, focus on organizing white men for collective liberation? Did you you see that they've got that going on too? I did not see that. I will have to look into that. I haven't seen that that particular campaign. No. Yeah, I found it through going to uh, uh, show up for racial justice. They've got a whole section on organizing white men for collective liberation. So. It's interesting. It kind of converges with uh, your message. Yeah, no, it's a, um, it's an important demographic for sure, and 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 kind of bringing that you know into into the conversation. So I'm gonna have to look into that. Thank you. Yeah, I I knew about them, but I hadn't heard about that particular um, aspect yet. So. Yeah, well, we're, we're old and white, and so we're having some very interesting conversations with our other old white friends. Um, for whom we have mostly avoided these conversations because they're difficult. And so now we don't want to avoid them anymore. And it's leading to um, 
a host of really interesting conversations. <laughs> yeah. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> it's even the same, you know, with my parents, things that I know how they feel about certain things. And, you know, even though I, I wouldn't put them necessarily on, on the wrong side of issues, they're, they're definitely sort of set in their ways. And so, um, but I guess I got a little bit of a primer in talking to them when I went vegan, <laughs> but I've been, you know, having more conversations now and you're right. It's, it's, it's tough, especially with people that, that you care about and because you run the risk of potentially ruining relationships if, if, you know, things don't go the way that you want them to. And um, I think for a lot of people, that's really scary, especially if they're people that you've had in your life for a long time. Um, I get that definitely. So. Well, and one of the things that we're finding is that there are a whole bunch of code phrases that we have allowed to stand for a long time. That means we're done with this conversation. And I, I can't think of the actual, you know, an actual phrase right now, but it's, it's like this agreement that we're not going any further. And now we're saying, uh, yeah, we are. <laughs> we need to have, we need to have, and then trying to figure out a way to do it that engages people in the conversation because walking away, even if we're willing to give up the relationship, that's not helpful to the right. movement. Right. And um, I, I don't know if any of you attended the DXC conversation last Saturday on how important anti-racism is to the animal rights movement. It was phenomenal. It was a two hour conversation um, last Saturday. And, and the point, the overall point was, if we don't dismantle these, these systems of oppression and racism against people of color, we will never be able to implement veganism. It's, it, it, it's not, it's not going to happen without doing that. So, so I'm, I'm sure DXC recorded that also. It might be interesting. Yeah. I'll have to. Thank you. I didn't know. I didn't know about that. So give my pen out. Yeah. Um, if I may say something, thank you, Kyla, for the presentation. It was, uh, it was very well thought out. Um, I want to give you a little perspective from, uh, I mean, from where I come from, okay? Um, so I've been working on climate healers for 13 years now. And when I started, I really didn't know what I was getting into. You know, I was just looking at environment and looking at the environmental problem from from my perspective, because I'm, I'm originally from India and I um, migrated to the US in, in 1981 as a student and then I stayed back here, right? So one of the first things, you know, when I discovered that um, colonialism is still going on in India, okay, was I had this sense of anger that I had been duped that we were all duped into, you were to told all these stories about freedom and independence, and you had this new independence song and all this nonsense, right? And all along, colonialism was going on, okay? You were all still colonized, and the whole world is still colonized through the currency system, through the International Monetary Fund, through the World Bank. These are all neo-colonialist mechanisms for continuing the colonization while telling everyone a story of, of independence and freedom. You have independence, you have freedom. Then I discovered that even the language we use, the language of earning a living, that's a very colonialist language because, because we talk about everyone having a right to life as given by our creator. And then we say you have to earn a living, okay? which means that if you don't serve the colonial master, you're not entitled to live, okay? You'll be out on the streets, you'll be begging and you'll probably just starve to death, right? So nine million people are starving to death every year, right? So I realized that we are in this system of oppression. It's actually a system of privileges. And those privileges are maintained through oppression. And every, uh, part of our, um, our government, our power structure is meant to maintain the system of privileges we have in place. Okay? 
because you have earned your privilege and now you you want the police to protect the privilege for you okay so then i realized there are lots of privileges you know i had a privilege as an educated person i have a privilege over someone who didn't go through formal education but who knows far more about certain things than i do okay who's contributing in their own way okay but uh, but my privilege my education is valued more than what they know you know so there are all these systems of privileges put in place that we we are being asked to maintain you know that we are told this is law and order right so you have to maintain this as is so this is why at climate healers i uh, i we we have this acronym for heal heal is human earth animal liberation and everything has to happen together there is no such thing as i will do animal liberation only then i'll focus on human liberation later or i'll focus on human liberation first and then i'll focus on animal liberation it all has to happen together and it doesn't happen by dismantling the current system it happens by creating a new system that is uh, fundamentally uh, non oppressive that's fundamentally uh, liberating in which we fundamentally let everyone feel like they belong on earth including the animals they all that we all belong and we are in this together and we're going to work together so that's how that's the story you're trying to tell at climate healers so we really see climate healers as the intersection of all of these movements so we are at the center of it you know we are trying to say we have to build a new system first and we have to build a new system in which these oppressions are not there these privileges are not there and uh, everyone feels they're treated fairly and and that we are telling a new story in which we all belong okay so that's that's what we try to do you know that's the main presentation that i give to people um and um uh, so within that context you know all of these i mean i tell people you know don't don't be ashamed that you you were born with these privileges you didn't choose how you where you want to be born right we were all born with certain privileges i was born with certain privileges i acquired some privileges so but it's when we go vegan that's when we realize that by relinquishing our privileges we actually get better we get healthier we feel better uh because the privilege we all have is the privilege of being born human okay and uh when we relinquish that privilege and then we discover that we are actually better off by doing that it teaches us a lesson that perhaps even white privilege is not what it's all cut out to be perhaps male privilege is not what it's all cut out to be you know perhaps educational privilege is not what it's all cut out to be and that it's okay to relinquish those privileges and to trust and have faith that when we create this new system in which there are no such privileges you are actually going to be healthier you are actually going to be better off the planet will thrive and that that we have a way out of this mess that we are in okay so that's the story we are trying to tell um so we have actually um in fact just before your meeting i was in another meeting where we are talking about how do we implement that uh, strategy that storytelling how do we create um, more formal certification processes for climate healers that people want to join you know and they want to take the course and they want to get certified and then they can go become climate healers the who go and tell the new story uh, who who can actually make the same presentations that i'm making yeah that's that's what we want to achieve right to create that and so your you know your presentation and the perspectives that you're bringing are within the context of the human liberation part of it and how it connects to the animal liberation part of it but there is an entire earth liberation part of it too where we have to dismantle all these fences we have because we are preventing wild animals from coming in think and saying this is mine as soon as we say this is mine you are back in the old system of privileges and so um uh, so i just wanted to give you some context uh, from my perspective so then 
I stopped being angry with the British and with the, <laughs> with the people who colonized India, who, who told me all these lies. You know, I stopped being angry with my teachers and my, <laughs> who, were, who were propagating these lies, who are still propagating these lies everywhere. Uh, so this is where we are telling lies. We have been telling lies all along. We, te- I mean, we, we routinely say earn a living to our children <laughs> and we don't even realize we are promoting colonialism by doing that, right? So you can see how even in our language, we are propagating the systems of privileges and um, how we are stuck in it. You know? Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And, and I, I really agree. And it's something that I've been trying to be better about, like understanding and focusing on is, the, is this need to, to really, like you said, build a new system before we can even think about, I, you know, I, I do feel like some dismantling needs to take place, but you're right. Like what, there's no point in, in breaking things down if there's nothing to, to replace it with. <laughs> and, and so, and, and I think that we are seeing that a lot too now with this, this move uh, for people to start building community coalitions and, and work with each other. And if you want to, you know, you hear the call to defund the police. Okay. Well, you got to have what you're going to replace that with first. You, you know, you can't just do away with this without having something new in place to um, to to replace it. And so I think that this um, this idea of building that new system is is really important. And I really appreciate um, that perspective too. And um, all those points are really great. And I love the storytelling. Um, I, I have done the moth stories here. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but like, I just feel like storytelling is is hugely powerful. Um, and back to, to Ben's point about not really necessarily knowing how to, to talk to people, I think that you're right, that, that underlying theme of making it about ourselves is what's so important because then we're not passing judgment, we're, we're not, you know, attacking or, or making other people to, to feel like, you know, they've done something wrong, we're pointing out the, the wrong in ourselves. And I think that that's an important thing to do anyway, to, to recognize, you know, places where we can fix our own, our own behavior, but using that, that personal storytelling um, to make those points, I think is really, um, really great and really powerful because I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I would never claim to have all the answers, but I, you know, I've been thinking about this too, that I don't think that we ever will. And I don't think that we ever should, because when we think that we have all of the answers, then we stop asking questions and we stop moving forward and we stop trying to learn and we, and we stop trying to make change. And, um, one of the other, so I know Anne mentioned um, having Afroism. So this is the other book by AFCO. I don't know if it's backwards, but Racism is Zoological Witchcraft. So good, so good, and a great follow-up. And one of the things that I really appreciate about this book is that she even acknowledges some of the things that she talked about in Afroism that she's changed her mind on. And, and this demonstrating for people that that's okay, that you put these ideas in print, you've published them as a book, and now you're coming over here and saying, well, maybe I was wrong. And, and here's how I learned and here's how I think different and maybe I'll think different the next time I write a book, you know? And, and I think that our willingness to change but also to let other people know that we've changed and that we've, you know, acknowledged new information and done something with that is, is so important. Um, and so, yeah, that was my little spiel there. Yes, Yes, um, one of the things I, I think, thank you, Salish, and thank you, Kyla. I would like a copy of that also. <laughs> um, we want slaughterhouses to close down immediately. All of us would agree to that. When I go to the slaughterhouse, I want to be able to say to the person working there how we can help you. Where will you go from here? So what you were saying is, is true. We do need to have something new ready to go. If we can, we still have to stop. And then and we can maybe say, uh, I'll help you individually. Uh, we'll find a way, have faith, because we're all in this together. Um, we've been given so much, so now's my opportunity to give to you. You know, so there has to be a way. Uh, the other thing that came up about uh, comparison, one of the, this is where I think people, this is where I'm not convinced that we shouldn't compare. We believe in making connections and to make a connection is 
seeing one thing and how it relates to another thing. But there may be some sensitivity that needs to be done of how we compare. But comparisons, I was sitting at an auction, I, I, I snuck into an, uh, an animal auction and I was sitting there and, and the way they treated them reminded me of the films, of uh, the drawings that I had seen, or yeah, not films, but drawings I had seen of auctions, of men on auctions. So I saw that. Now, is it wrong for me to, to talk about that or to com compare? And, you know, I don't think so. I'm still at a place where I don't think so. I don't think it's wrong to compare the Holocaust of the Jewish people and homosexuals to the Holocaust of the animals. I, I can say that because I feel the connections. Um, and, but I'm open to someone who does feel that sensitivity and I, I want to know more. So that's kind of where I am on that, thanks. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and and honestly, it was something that even though I myself didn't, I didn't draw those comparisons when I was doing outreach. It was it was something where I was like, I can understand that. And and even, um, you know, with the with the issue of sexual assault and and the exploitation of the female body and the way we see that played out in the dairy industry. You know, as a female, I was like, well, I I get that. Like, I can relate. But I also I was like, I don't know if I, I necessarily feel comfortable drawing that comparison, but I, I never really could put my finger on why. And um, I don't want I, I don't want you to think that I'm saying necessarily that that we shouldn't make the comparisons. My point was to to get us to think about the fact that really what what we need to compare is is where those oppressions are coming from, because that's what really can help people recognize that. That there is a connection. It's not so much that that I'm I'm seeing you know you in, in the situation of of an animal, but rather what has caused this to happen to you and what has caused this to happen to that non-human animal comes from the same place. And kind of what I started to do when I was doing my own outreach was um, making it personal for that person, and instead saying instead of saying like okay. Um, you know, this is exactly like what would happen to to the slaves or during the Holocaust. I would I would just ask them, how would you feel if you were in that situation? How would you feel if a loved one was in that situation? Um, if I was speaking to a person of color, it wasn't, again, something that I felt comfortable saying. So I would always ask them if they had a companion animal and ask them if they felt comfortable picturing their companion animal in, in that um, context. And so I think that there are ways because you're right, connection is so important and, and being able to put ourselves in the shoes of others is something critical. And I think that there are ways to do that um, that don't necessarily rely on, on those. Because I know that there are, are Holocaust survivors who, who make those comparisons themselves and who, who draw that. And I, I'm not gonna tell them no, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna tell them not to do that and that they're wrong because that's their experience. Um, but I've also heard from just as many people that they don't feel comfortable with that. And so just for me personally, as a white woman, I feel like I would rather err on the side of, of caution really, and, and be, be respectful of the people who have said, please don't do that. And if other people are, are in a position where that's their lived experience or, or their ancestors lived experience and they want to make that comparison, I'm not, you know, I'm not in any position to tell them not to do that. Um, and like I said, I don't, I don't want it to feel like I'm trying to attack that, that, that method necessarily. I just think that the way that we need to approach drawing the comparisons um, is what needs to change so that we can maintain that focus on what's really causing the problems, um, which is, is the systems themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Kyla. Yeah, we are also coming up with a talk track, so to speak, for climate healers. So the talk track is, you know, typical. This is these are the steps that you can take for effective advocacy on behalf of climate healers. And so it begins with the question: um, Would you ever deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? And everyone usually says no to that question. At least in my experience, I had thousands of people say no to me that experience. 
then I tell them, do you know that there are more animals killed every four to 12 hours by human beings than all the humans that ever died in wars throughout human history put together? So who is doing the killing? And who are they killing for? Okay. So when you ask those questions, people begin to see, oh, I was, I'm buying things that caused that killing to happen. Then I tell them, look, if, you are, if you're not aware of that, then you are privileged because there is someone who's doing that killing for you. And that is the crummiest job in the world. Okay? So this is why I say, you know, if you really want to have universal basic income throughout the world, you will, it cannot happen except in a vegan world. Because no one will do that job. Right? So... Uh, it, so it begins like, so this is the talk track that helps people. So first by asking a question for which they answered, uh, they answered something that makes them realize that they are not in alignment with who they really are. Okay. And then showing this, uh, I mean, talking about this horrific fact that wakes them up. To say, we need to do something about this. So the world is not being destroyed by alligators and bears, you know, it's being destroyed by us, as human beings, by our routine actions. So we don't even think about it, right? So, so it's, it's waking people up from that and then saying, okay, here is another way that we can live and we can get out of this mess by doing this, by becoming climate healers and so on. So that's how we are, we are sort of creating this stop track. Beautiful. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. I like that. I yeah. Like I mean, that second point is a good kind of alternative even to the, to the comparisons because you're still, you're helping people recognize the, just the absolute magnitude of the issue. And I know probably a lot of people have veterans in, in their family or, you know, active, you know, active duty service members. And so to draw that comparison between like all of the wars and you're like, well, whoa. <laughs> and there's, that other statistic too, I think it was that if we, if we killed humans at the same rate that we killed animals, we would all be dead in like 19 days. <laughs> and that just, I think statistics like that, it's difficult to really wrap your mind around. I did the math once um, and made a little infographic that said if we held a moment of silence for every single animal we killed, we'd have to be silent for 7,000 years. And um, that's just, it hurts. It hurts to think about those things, but that's that's really great. I think that those are really important points to help people start connecting with just how right. big an issue it really is. Um, I I was um, thinking about um, both Kyla and Silas. You mentioned you know the importance of words, and Benjamin mentioned being unsure exactly of of how to approach some things. Um, specifically in one of your last slides, you talked about one of the things we can do is to name, to recognize and name problematic behavior as it happens. And I saw, this is more of a proposal for everyone. Um, I saw recently there was a, a Zoom posted on a Black Lives Matter calendar here in Portland that was, it was interruption practice. So how we as, um, as allies can, can do that, can learn how and when to speak up as, as things happen. Um, and maybe that can be one of our future, um, you know, we can help each other. Or, or I, don't, I don't know if that's something where, where you have any resources for that, Kyla, or, or if anyone does, how we can practice um, interrupting when when we when we see a need. Well, both interrupting and and there's actually two parts of that conversation. So interrupting when you feel something happening to yourself. I no longer feel like I belong. Um, I'm feeling like I'm being pushed out. That conversation. And then the other part of that conversation is I see that happening to Suzanne or I'm afraid it's happening, Just, I, I can't be sure, right? But 
but I think I'm seeing it happen to someone else. So, so interrupting in, in both of those ways and how to do that in a way that, again, invites conversation and introspection rather than defensiveness, because that's what most often happens is it gets turned back around on the person that they're being too sensitive, that they're being whatever. And so how to do that in a way that, that invites a conversation to take place and, and some sort of remedy to be put in place. I think, yeah, that that's an important point to bring up too, is the defensiveness because, um, and Suzanne, this is definitely something that I would love to, to learn with you. It's something that I would like to be better at practicing. And even though I don't leave the house these days, <laughs> you know, like the situations will eventually arise where, you know, you're put in a situation where people are behaving or speaking in a way that, um, you know, is not okay. And so I've seen a lot of things floating around, um, you know, statements that you can make when, when you hear those things happening. And um, I'm really glad that Anne brought up the point of, of defensiveness, because I also have to wonder how I would react if somebody were to necessarily like drop that on me. If I were saying something, you know, I would love to think that I'd be like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, but is, that's not always the case. We're human and, and we don't, you know, we don't like to be wrong and we don't like to be called out. And so how can we compassionately, you know, say these things and compassionately interrupt in a way that, yes, invites conversation. I, I, I don't know, and I would love to, to explore that further because um, right now I don't know if I would be able to do that effectively and, and do that in a way that um, is constructive. You know, I could definitely say something, but is it gonna, <laughs> is it gonna be meaningful and is it going to um, invite the kind of discussion that I think is, is so important to, to follow anything up um, with? Awesome. Well, I'll keep an eye out on this calendar to see if I can attend an, another one here and invite people to. So. Uh, well, it's it's one thirty. I don't know if there are, or sorry, one thirty our time. Um, I don't know if there are any other comments. Um, I'm hoping that this discussion, you know, continues on online and even. Um, you know, we can get get more of a conversational meeting going. Yeah, Kyla, I really appreciate your willingness to do this. And although it's a small group here, lots more people will end up watching it. And I, I think that that this information is going to go a long way. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I hope so. Yeah. And, and that's even if we carry on the conversation into the message boards. That's, you know. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, we're getting a late joiner. <laughs> Hi, Anne-Marie. Um, we're actually just wrapping up, unfortunately. Oh, hello, I've, I've just seen the message now. I'm in the UK, so I just saw it now as I'm going to bed. <laughs> so. Well, uh, we recorded it, so we will we'll post it on Basecamp and, um, Thank okay, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> there, okay. All right then, thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks everyone. Thank you for putting those resources in the, um, in the chat too, Anne. I wanna make sure that I um, write those down, so. But I will send out the, or I guess, um, am I able to post the, the file for the, or I guess it's just a link. It's a Google Doc. I can just, <laughs> just share the link. Technology. All right. <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah, we'll connect on Basecamp and get these things okay. to share. And where will it be post? Is there a is there a room for that? Um yeah, we had this in the there's a vegans dismantling oppression. Yes. Session. So okay. there and then I think maybe in, in the docs and files there or message board item there, and we'll also post it on the main, the main link as well. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. thank you, everybody. All right, thank you. And thank you so much Bye. for being here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.